This is Vitals, visionary health leadership in action. Welcome everyone to Vitals Podcast. Vitals is an acronym representing value, innovation, technology, advocacy, leadership, and service. And these are the tools used by transformational leaders to initiate change to improve healthcare in the U.S. Neomed's Vitals is a monthly health leadership series in collaboration with university hospitals. This episode will feature Dr. Peter Pronovost, who serves as the Chief Quality and Transformation Officer at university hospitals. The biggest problem the world faces is our inability to solve complex problems collaboratively. Just look at healthcare. One in four patients are harmed. One in two suffer because they don't know how to care for themselves after discharge or they were disrespected. All but the very rich suffer from long months to get access to care. And if you're poor or if you're black, all of these outcomes are much worse. Labor productivity is negative. Costs are increasing. Payments are decreasing. Bankruptcies are going through the roof. 50% of hospitals have negative margins. And as a result, the very survival of not-for-profit healthcare that UH is a big part of this community and that has survived for 160 years is threatened. Yet it doesn't need to be that way. Dr. Pronovos believes that there is a solution that lies within all of us. The core reason for our inability to solve problems is a lack of love. Now, I know that probably sounds esoteric, so let me explain what love means to me. And here, love is an energy that uplifts and connects us all. Love is a force innately in each of us, and that means we matter. We are born worthy of having respect, of having agency, of having our voices heard. Love sees wisdom and the beauty in every person and invites their ideas to the table, regardless of their pedigree. Love is the absence of separation. Yet too often, we other, we are separated. We look down on people. We think that we are smarter than them, so we develop top-down command and control solutions that never work. We say that if you don't work at the right hospital or that you don't have the right degree or title after your name or you don't go to the right college or you don't dress the right way or you stutter like I do or your skin's not the right color, you don't have the right to correct ideas, then your voice somehow counts less to such an extent that some people believe that they are less worthy and they don't speak up. We discount ideas, diminish the ability to debate for fear of being contempt or being canceled. And in doing so, we destroy progress and innovation. And people feel demeaned, demoralized, and have decreased energy. We destroy all of our ability to solve problems and diminish value for all. When we lead with love, the opposite happens. We believe in people that they're innately good. We respect, uplift, and unleash their brilliance. We feel we matter and that we feel we are valued and add value and thus support dialogue and encourage the free flow of ideas without fear. We seek good ideas and effective solutions from wherever they may emerge. We focus on what works rather than who brings forth ideas. And love is strong enough for you to dislike someone's ideas, yet see their common humanity. When you leverage the power of love within and between people, you solve problems better, faster, cheaper. Learning and innovation flourish. And let me be clear, this is not some feel-good philosophy without accountability. For sure, it's more joyful. Yet love is the path to results. That's the leadership the world needs. It's the leadership that healthcare needs. So how can the seemingly simple concept impact health systems? Dr. Pronovo shares how he came to realize the power of love in healthcare and leadership. My origin story is the origin story of my worldview and my philosophy on healthcare. I was born the son of two orphans, yet we created a super strong family. I felt I mattered so I could question and discuss problems. My voice was heard. My parents empowered me and I felt significant, secure, and loved. Our family is small, yet devoted to each other. My interest in safety was forged from healthcare's failings. At the young age of 50, my father died after being misdiagnosed. He could have been saved by a bone marrow transplant, yet by the time we got the correct diagnosis, it was too late. And I remember carrying his crumbling 80-pound body up to this bedroom with him writhing in pain. He suffered for a week, and during that time, a desire to improve healthcare was etched in my soul. When I was applying for med school, I experienced a pretty profound lack of love. Johns Hopkins was my top choice. And when I was interviewing, an older physician said to me, why should we admit you to Hopkins when you didn't go to an Ivy League college? 
I responded by a question to saying, do you have evidence that students from Ivy Leagues are better doctors? My GPO is 4.0, and you may discount that, but yet my MCATs are the top 99% in the country. So if you believe in objective tests, then I meet your standards. I was accepted and went on to be one of their top published and rewarded physicians in the school's history. And just prior to my fourth year of med school, my father died, and I was not going to able, be able to continue because I couldn't afford it. And that older physician waived my tuition. I will never forget his love. After I graduated, I did my residency fellowship and PhD at the Hopkins School of Public Health. And I was publishing and doing well, but I wasn't excited. I didn't have my purpose. My dad's experience made me want to improve things. That de desire ignited when Josie King died. It was at that point that Dr. Pronovost found out how his experience with a patient could change the trajectory of his career. Josie was an adorable 18-month-old girl who looked hauntingly like my daughter and was born days apart. Josie died from a central line infection that led to sepsis and teamwork errors, all of which was preventable. And at the time, these infections killed more people than breast or prostate cancer, and we just accepted them as the cost of business. We accepted that when you care for sick people, little girls will die. Her mom, Sorrell, asked me if I could tell her that no other children would die the way Josie had. And I had a moral moment. I wanted to say yes, to tell her that all the great things we were doing to prevent harm, but I couldn't. Our infection rates were sky high and the whole countries were too. So I did the thing that love calls us to do. I told the truth. I said, no, I can't tell you today, but I will be able to tell you one day soon. That experience with Josie's mom sent me on a journey of rigor and accountability that became a career in keeping patients safer, improving value, and creating a new category of quality improvement research. That launched an effort to eliminate these infections, first at Johns Hopkins, then in the state of Michigan, then state by state in the U.S., and then in eight additional countries. Now, this was frightening. There was no playbook on how to eliminate harm in a country. We had to persuade five federal agencies, the American Hospital Association, state health departments and state hospital associations, and scores or hundreds of health systems in every state to work together when they had never had before. At the time, Health and Human Services measured these infections five different ways. And what worked was aligning around a common purpose, agreeing on a common goal, and connecting and unleashing all powers to eliminate, to innovate towards those goals. The lessons I learned through that experience is that love not only allows you to stand in your bright light, it also puts you under the spotlight. Love demands accountability, accountability that first seeks other success rather than to punish, to support and inspire rather than to judge. The science of quality improvement at the time was not science at all. Indeed, the common mantra was that data was for quality improvement, not research, you know, as if the data know the difference. My view was that if I was going to be able to look Sorrell in the eye and publicly tell her that little girls like Josie would be less likely to die, we needed robust data. Unfortunately, there was no robust data collection in this area. In fact, existing attempts averaged 80% missing data. We changed that. We required participating health systems to commit to less than 10% missing data or they wouldn't be allowed to continue to participate. None of them dropped out and 80% of the hospitals in the program went over a year without an infection. My roles at Johns Hopkins grew. I was a professor in the schools of medicine, public health, nursing, business, and engineering. I ran the ICUs, was the SVP for the system and quality, and founded the Armstrong Institute, a research group that brought together 18 different disciplines from every school in the university and became one of the most prominent quality and safety research groups in the world. And just before COVID, we left for Cleveland. My wife, Dr. Marlene Miller, was appointed the chair of PEDS, the first woman chair at UH and the physician chief of Rainbow and Babies. And I joined university hospitals with the goal of creating a model for value. In Cleveland, Dr. Pronovost would have the opportunity to show the value of leading with love. Our thesis that is, if we use the framework of living and leading with love, we can transform care. And our model was very simple, a practical 
way to operationalize love. We call it believe, belong, build. And it's based on what's needed and what works in transformation. All employees must believe their job is to improve value, feel empowered to do so, and have a clear, inspiring vision of the future that is better because of their efforts and it's aligned with their values. We need structures and cultures so that people belong to a learning community, a network that supports the free flow of ideas from anywhere they emerge so we can share promising practices and innovate faster. And we need to build robust management and accountability systems. We apply these to keep people healthy at home instead of healing in hospital and made visible and eliminated defects and value in people's care. Now, you may think this is the soft stuff, but here's the thing. You don't have to take my word for it. Let's look at the results. Reducing annual medical care costs, excuse me, Medicare costs by 33%, saving the Medicare program over $100 million and receiving $50 million in shared savings in this year alone. It was a third of our EBITDA at UH when just four years ago, it was less than a million. Reducing surgical length of stay from 6.2 days to 2.5. Sepsis mortality by 70%. A1C for 1,000 patients by 1.5 points. Reducing the cost of care for people with complex lives by $1,000, I mean $10,000 a year, while tripling their sense of well-being and belonging. Reducing sentinel events by 70%. Reducing system length of stay for the first time in our history. And yet these are just a sample of examples of scores of projects that all had breathtaking results This with this model. Yet patients are still suffering harm and we're still riddled with waste. So join us on the journey of zero harm. The impact of the patient who inspired his quest for a safer delivery of care goes far beyond Dr. Pronovost's individual practice. Josie's mom had asked if other children would be less likely to die. At first, I couldn't tell her yes. Now we can. We achieved an 80% reduction of these infections that killed Josie across the entire United States, a problem the size of breast or prostate cancer, and by 70% in eight other culture, countries. Yet the culture changes were just as robust, dramatic, and enduring. Sorrell and I talked to hundreds of hospitals around the world and to scores of media outlets. This ignited a movement of patients whose loved ones had been harmed, forgiving and partnering with health systems to make things make things better. We built teamwork and collaboration on clinical teams to ensure doctors used a patient safety checklist and as a partnership of accountability. We transparently shared results to hold health system leaders accountable for zero harm. The deeper lesson we learned is that it wasn't only the checklist that was the magic. It was a belief system changing. Clinicians began to believe that it's not inevitable that little girls are going to die. They believed in zero harm. And more importantly, they believed that they could work collaboratively to achieve that. They found and felt the power of love. Yet feel that same energy around zero harm when you walk around UH on the hospital wards, in the clinics, in our team meetings, and at our Tuesday clinical transformation call. When you live and lead with love, everything feels different. Problems seem less daunting. It's precious and it's a powerful gift. As a result of uh, these efforts, UH what we received recognition with winning the AHA Quest for Quality Award. Six reviewers stayed at UH for three days. And when they left, they said, we felt that transformative energy of love that you shared in the opening comments. We experienced all of your staff engaging in improving value and making personal I will statements. Our only question is, how do we spread this? Dr. Pronovost's answer to that question is simple. Lead with love and remember that sometimes the impossible actually is possible. You see, the biggest lie we accepted in healthcare is that we label harm as inevitable rather than preventable. We shrug our soldiers and say, things happen. And when you care for sick people, little girls are going to die. Fathers are going to die. I refuse to believe that. These are not unsolvable problems, not in healthcare, not in the world. The capability is in every one of us if we just live and lead with love. Don't get overwhelmed by how daunting or nebulous this sounds. Start by simply reflecting on a time when you felt you mattered, empowered, and connected with people to solve problems. That playful energy that anything is possible is something most of us have experienced. Tap into it. You see, love is lived in micro moments of positive connection. So go make a micro moment. Here are a few of my favorites. Listen to a colleague who is suffering. 
innovate with a colleague and create that uplifting, playful, puppy-like energy. Declare a goal of zero harm when working with the team. Pause for a moment when walking into a patient's room to create empathy and think, just like me, this person is a mom, a dad, a grandmother. Feel the energy when you debate ideas and then create a common purpose and path forward. Ask what you learned and how you could support a team when they fall short of its goals. Assume positive intent when you disagree with someone. Thank caregivers by name for improving value when, they, when you pass them. And when you're feeling overwhelmed that you've been tasked with an insurmountable goal, like eliminating infections in the U.S., take comfort in knowing that leading doesn't mean you have all the answers. It simply means you have the courage to ask questions, the clarity to convene the right people, and the commitment to see the task through. The answers to the problem dwell with the people. Believe in them. Love's other name is understanding. Without understanding, we cannot love. The most powerful micro moment you can create is to be humble, curious, and compassionate enough to deeply listen to the people around you, to learn from them, and thanks for helping you make the world a better place. I want to share one final micro moment with you. My mom has advanced dementia and is in an assistant living facility, and she doesn't recognize me or others anymore. Yet recently, we had this beautiful micro moment when she did. We looked into each other's eyes and we connected. We felt deep, that deep love in our souls and wept tears of joy. The moment was fleeting, but the power of love was awe-inspiring. We face many challenges in healthcare and in the world. The power of love is that we all matter and are connected with all of our messiness and majesty. We can leverage that power of love within and between people to make the world a better place. All of us have experienced the pain of feeling unloved and the power from being loved. Imagine how much better the world would be if more of us live and lead with love. Someone has to believe in people and say, this is a problem, it's within my power to solve, and then go convene a group to improve it. That someone is you. My friends, go live and lead with love. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Vitals Podcast. Be sure to visit Neomed's YouTube channel to see the full one-hour Vitals presentation, including the audience Q&A, which is moderated by Monica Robbins senior health correspondent at WKYC in Cleveland. Until next time. This is Vitals, visionary health leadership in action.